And with that, we are live. We're uh, starting uh, Stocks and Scotch episode 13 a little differently. Everything switched around. So the pre-show is now the sort of pre-show with Howard. And then we're going to do an interview with uh, the founder of a little company called Motif, possibly the most interesting investment opportunity and investment vehicle I've ever seen. And uh, we have Howard and Ed Matz with us now. So it's a little bit different setup from the pre-show. Uh, say hello, guys. Hello, guys. Yeah, hello, guys. <laughs> hello, yeah. gentlemen. Gentlemen. How, how I didn't like some of the things I was saying is he's come to sit in, just make sure, put me straight, you know. Put you straight. In <laughs> hey, smack you in the knackers. So, but, Howard, uh, I mean, we were talking before the camera started rolling, and Did you, you had a really nice input, and it's basically what people are talking about right now in terms of markets. There's one thing people are talking about. Is this a bubble? Or and then a small minority says it's not. Can you can you take us a little bit around? Uh, you've been around a few years, and so have you. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't mean offense to to the people that uh, are on food stamps because that's at a record high too. So I think I think you know it's like deflation and inflation, depending on what part of the world you're you're looking at. Um, today I got a link that there's. Uh, um, Benedict Evans sent a picture of a $50 smartphone, which is something that we've been talking about, and then my friend Points and Figures sent me a picture of a $150 club sandwich in Australia. So I think, I think we've, at, at some level, we're in some kind of weird vortex where we've got depression, inflation, deflation, a bubble, and a boom. I would, I just choose for myself for getting out of bed in the morning uh, to call this a boom. Um, I don't see how anybody in their right mind can call it a bubble. You know, there's there's definitely some freshly minted billionaires from the Twitter IPO, and uh, you know, the Snapchat phenomenon has uh, made uh, a few uh, people billionaire on paper. But uh, you know, a bubble. But I feel that's more of a boom, meaning that. Uh, yes, people are turning down silly offers, and maybe the Twitter valuation will peak at its first day pricing. But it it affects so few people. And while GeoCities disappeared, and many of the companies of the bubble of 1999 disappeared, Tesla's not going to disappear. Bitcoin is not going away. Um, 3D printing is just getting started. There's some bubble phenomenon there, but 3D printing in 30 years uh, will we still be going down to the corner store or FedEx store to print on a 3D printer or maybe have one at home, or it will evolve even further than that, and there will be uh, drones uh, following people around. And then fourthly, and Tesla will be around in some form or another. So a bubble is when things disappear, like our homes. In the credit bubble, we lost our homes. In the internet bubble, 90% of the companies went away. And uh, in a boom like we have today, uh, tons of things are, are going to be around. for we're, we're, we're watching the invention of brands that will be around 30 to 50 years from now. So that that's the way I choose to look at the world. Ed, uh, chime in. Yeah, I, well, what you say, the key thing you're talking about there is, is aggregate and specific. Aggregate boom, aggregate bust, and specific boom and bust. We're seeing... Yeah, there might be a few instances, I don't know, California property, whatever, you know more about that than I do, that may be bu approaching bubble status, but a lot of things are just coming out of one of the biggest recessions we've seen in many, many years. And so they're very early on the uh, on the curve. Whereas if you look at what's going on elsewhere, and in aggregate, the if you look at the correlations, it, we're not approaching anywhere near a boom status, or we, we're not even approaching boom, let alone a bubble. So I think you need to sure. you step back and you say, yeah, some things may be getting a bit frothy, some things aren't. But the very fact that some things are and some things aren't is not typical of a general bubble, not typical of you know your 2008 when most things were correlated, most things were getting frothy, you know, bar one or two um, small things on, on the fringe. And so the very fact we're talking about it, look, guys, if we're talking about it, there's a good chance it's not a bubble. I think that's a great point by Ed because one of the key uh, reasons for I, I just pulled up a chart here of uh, the e minutes behind me, and um, I, I think one of the interesting things about uh, the that the drop you see right there in the beginning is uh, in in 2000, uh, 2008 is what there was such a deep understanding of uh, this is a new age 
like things cannot fall. But it seems that everyone is talking about everything is going to fall. So the irrational exuberance or whatever you want to call it, it's kind of not here. But um, uh, there, there's been a lot of talk about this lately, and it's like two weeks, last two weeks, it's been escalating. I don't know, why do you think that is? Is it like Bitcoin related or why would you think like from an investor psychology point of view? How price. Are... Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, Ed, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's price. The higher, <laughs> the mistake people think is the higher something is, therefore the, the more long the market must be. The very fact that a lot of people haven't actually um, been involved, um, partly because a lot of money wasn't around at the beginning, you know, when they um, but things were a bit tougher. People didn't weren't, weren't long of cash. They weren't able to invest, and now it's going up. It's too hard high to buy. So there's a lot of money. I think there's a lot of money out there looking for a home that isn't invested in the stock market. And they look at the price and saying, "Wow, fifteen thousand. It was fifty percent lower not so long ago." I, everyone must be long and therefore it's approaching um, bull status. It's partly wishful thinking because a lot of people want to get involved who have missed the move because they didn't have the cash and as it pulls back they'll probably buy into it but they don't want to touch it at this point and so you know, 15,000 plus, 15,800, 16,000 soon to be, it's too high, high to buy. You look at the chart behind you, you look at what's going on in the last week or so, last few weeks, the amount of breadth to this last rally is non-existent. A lot of people talk about aggregate booms and aggregate busts. There's not a lot of general movement, which to me says the same point we talked about before. This market is trapped by taper, so it gets frothy on the upside. People say, "Ah, oh, it's 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 a bubble ready to go." They don't want to buy. Comes back five ten percent. They might be more interested in buying. It depends on what the economy is doing. So um, sideways. A lot of talk about boom and bust going sideways. Let's have a debate for another three months. What are you doing now, Howard? Uh, are you asking me that at the moment, or like stuff that I'm investing in, or <laughs> like literally now? <laughs> no, but I mean because you you are the most positive person I've ever met. You're so positive that you've fundamentally changed my outlook on the world. I have become. I understand. I understand. Positive... But you have to you have to factor in one thing. I can afford to travel. Uh, I love my job. Uh, I have two healthy kids at the moment. Uh, knock on wood. I have friends all over the world. I can use Uber, or, and we'll get into this rock star thing of anybody can be a rock star. But I have Uber. I have hotels tonight. I have clean shoes. I have uh, comfortable underwear. Um, uh, even in a middle seat, I'm kind of optimistic on a jet blue flight. Wi-Fi is going to be on airplanes. I'm trying to think of something negative. Hang on. Uh, I can no, get but a the gun. thing is, you hang did on, write the on. post. I can buy a gun down the street. Uh, <laughs> I can 3D print my gun if I'm too lazy to walk down the street. So uh, what was it five years ago? I can mute Ed at any moment at the click of a button. <laughs> uh, no, but you wrote minute, the blog post to, saying that this on, is top. I'm still trying to think of why you it's so call bad the top. Out there. You called the top in your blog. And What's that? that was uh, last week. Uh -oh, oh, well, you, you, you I had to pull up your blog right here. But uh, you wrote. Don't read uh, me. Don't read me. Talk to me. What did <laughs> no, I but, say? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to say uh, the exact words. But basically, it was the first time I ever. Here comes the track. Here comes the crash. This time, I'm serious about the bubble. And this week's uh, yes. Oh, but you. that was a sarcastic headline. Oh. I, that's just you got to read the blog post. It's a it's a sucker's headline uh, just for Google juice. Uh, but the uh, if you read the article, I'm making fun of uh, the people that are calling it that. Oh, that's um, good. So, so uh, you didn't change your mind because I thought I was I was misreading you completely. Well, I'm very worried with that the host and partner of my show doesn't understand me. So that, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> okay, I'm eating raspberries. You really are drinking scotch. You know, I'm I'm as I'm as bullish as I've ever been. I'm completely underinvested. I'm comfortable being as underinvested as I can. In our in in the stock twits 50 model portfolio, we're only 35 percent invested. Because my two favorite stocks, I haven't been able to get a position in because I feel like they've uh, been extended uh, from a from a. So I don't own Google and I don't own Nike, and that's really cost me um, just oh, because okay. I've owned them from so long ago. So so I I, I find it uh, I don't have a personal reason, and, I, and you know, like I said, I knock on wood uh, that I'm I'm in the uh, I'm in a career that I love to do, and I live in California and I can afford to pay my taxes. So I'm not the right guy to ask. But given my background, if I was bearish, uh, there'd be something wrong with me. And if I and I and I'm sure I'd have a bigger following and I'm sure I'd be a wealthier guy yeah. uh, in, in my profession. 
if I was bearish all the time. You know, if I came from the did podcast from the beach every week saying the world is going to come to an end, I'm sure I'd have a much bigger following because I could spread fear and say, look at me, I'm on the beach, you know, this is, you know, this is their warning. But I just don't think, uh, I think I can do better by telling people that uh, everywhere around them there's a boom. If they have an iPhone and they have an Uber app and a Hotels Tonight and Priceline and Google Maps and, uh, um, you know, Snapchat and, a, and, a, and, a, and, and the ability to read, uh, of course, if you grow up in a in the in an inner city and your parents are drunks and and uh, we're I can't I can't talk for that demographic. It's terrible. But in any demographic that isn't there, uh, we're in a boom. We're in a giant boom, and nobody has an excuse other than in that situation uh, not to figure out a way to make a living and have some fun. Alan, go ahead. Everybody. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you two questions. One is, uh, I'm really interested that you're underinvested because I have this. Um, I'm convinced the world is underinvested, which is maybe slightly contrary and slightly different to what a lot of people are thinking that it's fully invested in the stock market. I don't think it is. The second thing is, tell me, if you, um, because you are underinvested, would you rather buy uh, companies or or, or a percentage of a company through the stock market currently, or would you rather buy it direct? In other words, would you be more interested in startup in real businesses rather than businesses reflected on paper in the stock certificate? Okay, that's the that's the great question. Thank you, Ed. So so. I think you're seeing this play out every day with geniuses like uh, in the startup world who aren't taking their money and reinvesting it in stocks, they're reinvesting it in more paper and in illiquid investments. So at some level, uh, the very wealthy are chasing illiquid investments. Um, now that is brought on by the Fed and low interest rates in, around the world is one thing. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So So one of the reasons is obviously just Fed policy and monetary policy is forcing uh, the very rich to chase a liquid end of the spectrum. For example, I'm in New York this week, and you would think that every hedge fund in the world uh, has already put their money in, 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 and started putting their money in, in tech. Okay, but I would say maybe three percent of the big hedge funds in the world have started uh, dabbling in that, and and they're bypassing the U.S. The ones that are leaving Templeton and going right to Africa and going right to uh, uh, the you know really hard off the edge beaten path places to back entrepreneurs. Okay, so so the money's just starting to go to the edge. Uh, and this is from people who have grown up 20, 30 years building billion dollar hedge funds, they're starting to see, and I'm in meetings, I'm not going to name names, but they're just starting to see the frontierism that's possible, right? And so I think the, the stock market has become much more be about behavioral uh, finance than about true economics and true uh, financial statements. And this is just the beginning of some kind of weird... Uh, trend that we're in, probably brought on by Facebook and the fact that we're all connected and that the mood uh, has driven markets more than ever here. But at the same time, there is so much money tied up in, in boring, uh, mispriced, uh, you know, overpriced assets like Coke, Johnson & Johnson, 3M. These are not cheap assets, even though they have great cash flow, that uh, real money is moving to the fringe and saying, listen, give me three kids and a $3 million startup and bang me some code and uh, I'll take the write-off rather than the risk of, be, of, of, of owning some of these of, of these liquid stocks. Go ahead. Sorry. I, 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 have, I have some input on this because there was a big hedge fund conference by UBS in, uh, in London today and yesterday. And what's so interesting, it's exactly the same thing they're talking about. So when you, when you bring in these like big global macro guys like this these like have um, sort of heavy money or whatever you want to call it, like these guys who normally would never ever touch a tech startup, and when they're they're yeah. being pressed on who to invest in, they're not saying uh, I don't know some like uh, J C Penny or something like that. They're they're not talking about uh, like uh, what do you call it like a free cash yield or they're, they're not talking about anything like this. They're looking towards tech towards the future. And uh, what we've seen is or, or is, solar or energy. There's yeah, but but like energy. like inspirational stories, like change, like big movements. And uh, it, it seems that the the old money, the 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 very conservative money, is 
very much getting into the Uber style businesses because they see not only it's a good story to tell the clients, but it's also a, a incredible business model. And who cares about some stodgy, very like mature investment when you can own Uber? Well, I, 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 I oh, sorry, I don't let you chime in. I mean, I'm only uh, saying this because of meetings that I've had this week. Is that again, like not to name names, but. The fathers in these big family offices are still not going to come into this business that we're talking about on the mm -hmm. fringe. But the sons are, and the daughters are, and it's they're calling it the frontier, right? They don't believe in it. It doesn't have cash flow uh, yet. Um, so they're not jumping in with 50% of their portfolio. But with their family offices, they're scrambling to find the smartest people they can because they like they're not just going to willy-nilly throw money around that's for sure they they do their due diligence and they try and find the right people to back and so there's a lot of that happening now my phone's never rang more than it has uh, from people on the east coast and they're not saying Howard here's a check it's not that good but they are wanting to talk and they're wanting to probe and they are want to just kind of see uh, if the valuations are still workable so so that leads me to believe that that money is still just early days wanting to find a home. There's just not much of a home. I mean, you know, chasing Snapchat at $3 billion is not investing. That's just stupidity, okay? That's got away from you. That got away from people. Isn't Go that ahead. defensive investing? Isn't that actually saying they don't... They're not really a. It's not really a positive move offering three billion. It's actually saying we need to do that or be seen to be doing that because uh, otherwise, what are we going to do? How are we going to face off a competition in a world or in a sector that they are going to struggle to face off? Or it's the VCs calling TechCrunch and saying we have an offer, even though there's no offer. Let's face it. Uh, spreading a rumor today in the private world. Uh, we joke about it like in the Boski days it was all about spreading rumors about public stocks today all the rumors are spread about private stocks just to just to get jollies off uh, nobody's even making money off of it it's just a bunch of people saying if they can move uh, if they can get a journalist or a blogger to say something nobody's checking facts uh, and and uh, and everybody who and they know who they are those are the people I'm talking about they're making up stupid headlines uh, just like I tricked um, uh, Sver into saying I'm a bear with my headline. This shit's going on every day, I'm sorry, I'm and <laughs> and people are taking this stuff as gospel. And I do this all the time. And I'm, you know, we're playing a game with headlines for Google Juice or for uh, effect, but nobody's reading the meat of the story. So, what I do find interesting is happening less and less in the stock market, uh, and more and more in the private market. And I don't know what that means. Uh, and I agree with you, Ed. That's a really good point a really good point they are just probing they're not really serious about it and that's fine with me because when we're in a bubble they will be serious if you if Andy Kessler tells this great story and he told it at Oktoberfest that it took him forever to make you know turn 10 million into a hundred million and uh, with a lot of risk and then once you got to the hundred million it was easy to get to a billion okay and that's when people were just coming up to him and handing him a check for half a billion dollars okay I can just tell you from my own money raising that it's still really hard to raise 30 to 50 million. And if it was a bubble, I trust you, you'll know because uh, I will have a 50 to 100 million dollar fund. We'll be much closer to a bubble when that's the case. Okay, that's a great data point you're pointing out there. How is it like to raise money now? Because you, uh, I was looking a little bit at one of your funds uh, earlier this week, and uh, I mean, you've invested in so many exciting startups. <coughs> In one of your funds, uh, in the the social leverage fund, mm -hmm. what is it like to to raise money for for funds like that? Is it is it hard or is it easier or what what do people say? I mean, do people care about this or is it still like a very tough sell? Uh, I think it's a tough. I make it a tough sell because you, I tell people they're going to lose all their money, and I'm running stock twits. Truly, you know, I'm. Uh, my my day job is to run StockTwits, so I'm on the stream thinking about stocks and, and communicating with our community and writing and uh, trying to get StockTwits everywhere. Uh, so so raising money is second, um, but I don't think there's a harder job in the world for someone who's in the upper class or in the in who's who's uh, upwardly mobile. I mean, than raising capital because institutions. Uh, are very difficult. They have an extreme checkbox list. Uh, 
that doesn't mean they do due diligence. It means you have to fit inside a hundred different boxes. And uh, if you don't fit inside a box before they even get down to due diligence, they're not going to, you know, they're going to let you see the door. So I don't think raising money is is easy. So I, again, another data point of why I don't think we're in a bubble. I think I think we're in a bu I think we're in a boom because there's some great companies that money is flowing into, and a lot of that is liquidity, right? People buy Tesla because they know that they can sell Tesla the next day. I mean, that's just a function of liquidity. And there's people still worried from 2008 because 2008 was a liquidity crisis on top of everything. I want my money back is generally still the way people are investing, Ed, and you know that. So people are still more scared than they are uh, uh, fearful. And, I mean fearless. And until I see that fearless, reckless uh, attitude, and we've seen moments of it in biotech, we've seen moments of it in Bitcoin where the fear of missing out is uh, greater than the fear of getting in. Definitely some moments of it. Uh, but tonight, I don't want to be involved in that. I'll just move on to the next asset. And everybody has that right. Actually, what, what is funny is Bitcoin, in a way, is, is a microcosm of what's really going, going on elsewhere because it's just condensed. The people in Bitcoin are the people who want to buy. The, the skeptics aren't going to rush in and buy Bitcoin. You can bet your money on that one. And so it's, it's the same with the, the global economy or the U.S. economy and the stock market. People are... are they're not going to rush in because they think it's too high to buy. One of the, possibly one of the greatest ironies of quantitative easing is, is the money, the liquidity is, is in there, out there somewhere, looking for a home. And yet, with the stock market 15,000, to be 16,000, it doesn't want to go into the stock markets. And that's your point about it going to the fringes. And that, my point was it actually may be one of the greatest ironies and profitable ironies for the global economy is that money actually finds a real home and goes into direct investment, maybe on the fringe, maybe a younger generation who gets the money to invest and actually spurs on the, on the real growth that you know the stock market may go sideways but the real economy actually catches it up if I'm making any sense at all. Do you, and it would be an irony that the money's been sitting there from quantitative easing, went into gold, pretty much a worthless asset in that sense, but into the stock market too high and now the money, the real money is looking for a home and it goes into real investment and they don't want to go into the Coca-Cola or JC Pennies. they want to go in something that might actually provide real genuine growth, which could be social media. Could be like AngelList kind of investments? Yes, except I mean, a point Howard's made, a very valid point, is, uh, and it's easy to forget, is a lot of this money is old school and it's not going to rush in to uh, you know, new generation businesses, new generation ideas, because they're not they're unsure of it, and, and you know where the sons and daughters take over, I mean you may see that that happening. That may be the spur. Finally, the, there's a new generation of real investors. If that comes along, then you can bet your money that the new generation of businesses probably will take off as well. But that takes time. Yeah, it's time. It takes time, and. Uh... Good combo. I, I, I totally uh, am at peace with the way we're discussing this here. Um, and I think I think if you're a beginning investor listening in, uh, you know, there's all these tools like StockTwits or StockTwits50, which Ivan and I created, or just listening in to the stream uh, anywhere and and find some smart people. You know, it all starts with one investment. Uh, it's a shame. Uh, that people aren't investing more uh, because there's just so much knowledge available to people. And, uh, you know, the basic investment thesis comes down to a glass of water. You look at it, is it half full or it's half empty? And, um, you know, there was an old skiing trick. You know, when you were water skiing and you didn't know what um, uh, foot to put the boot on and you would hold the rope and you get pulled and whatever foot came forward first, that was your foot. And the same thing with investing. There's one, there's one way to look at investing, half, half full, half empty. If I show a glass of water to a client and they go, oh, my God, it's half empty, uh, I, know they're, I, know they're, I know what they are. And if they say it's half full, I know what they are. And you can give them 900 other tests, but uh, they're not lying when they tell you what that glass looks like. And, um, I mean, they can trick and lie to you and lie to themselves, but... Uh, you know, generally, I look at the world as a glass is half full, okay? And um, I think it pays to, to, 
to think if you really are going to invest to look at the world that way. Okay, and if you don't look at it that way, there's ways to learn and follow people to help you look at it that way. You don't have to be on leverage and overfill the glass. You just have to position yourself that there's, you know, and that's why I'm underinvested. It's okay. You know, there'll be. I'm only 48. I got 30 years of investing ahead of me. I don't have to be fully invested all the time. Um, so I think I think there's no shame in being underinvested. I think a lot of people don't understand that concept, and. Uh, you know, you need to be able to sleep at night, and you need to be able to have cash available to do fun stuff and emergency things and family issues and other things and health potential problems. So being underinvested is not a sin. Being on margin to me is the biggest uh, risk uh, most investors do. They just have too much invested, and they're forced to sell at the absolute wrong times. I've just seen it happen to the wealthy and to the beginners and to everybody else. The bull market, they think they need to get 100% invested right away to keep up with the averages. Um, mm -hmm. so, so other than half full, half empty, I think you turn off the TV is the second thing. And then the third thing is forget what the averages are doing. Focus on what your assets are doing. And um, those are like the three key things that I would add. Add any, anything to add to that? Well, yeah, it's interesting because I was just thinking about Jan what Janet Yellen was talking about this week. Not so much about you know taper because that's kind of I think it's fairly obvious, and what she was saying is fairly obvious. But more about the big banks, you know, banks too big to fail. The problem with the banks um, and even fund management companies is the averages. Is people invest in them and sitting tapping them on the shoulder and saying, well. You need to keep up with um, you know, the next bank or, or fund management or hedge fund or, or whatever, otherwise we're going to pull our money. And so they're forced into high risk. They're forced into margin situations, to use your analogy. And that's where you get into you know, real serious problems. And that's the issue I think Janet Yellen's got to address if she's going to go down that path. It's not so much the, you know, the regulation and the paperwork is to address the, the concept of not just greed, but global aggregate greed, where the whole sector moves together because they're all fighting each other because they want to prove better returns. Whereas the individual investor is right. They can sit back and say, no, I don't want to jump in. The JP Morgans of this world, the Shearsons, AIGs, they, they couldn't afford to say no. They had to jump in because otherwise their shareholders are going to give them grief. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're lucky. I say this again. Small investors are lucky. They don't have the same stupid pressures that large investors do. Uh, do, uh, do you have to go now, Howard? Yeah, uh, I got to said... hop to catch a flight. So, gentlemen. Can, can we talk AngelList or do you have to go right now? I got to go right now. So, uh, okay. But thank you so much for getting on. And I know you're in uh, New York now. And you can give us a view of the city before you check out. There it is, New York. Short seller's paradise. Lovely. You're not going to sing so much as well? for checking in with us, Howard. It's really What's appreciated. That, what, what was that, Ed? I just wondered if you're going to burst into song at the same time. That's what you do. In New York, yeah, I was it? at I was at the clear I was at the John Fogerty conference yes uh, concert yesterday at the Beacon, who uh, played at uh, uh, Woodstock. So uh, uh, it was pretty damn cool hanging out uh, front row with uh, uh, some friends, listening to uh, some classic classic. Uh, uh, rock. You're too uh, young for that, aren't you? 48? A, a 40, well, I think I got to think that John Fogarty is like 60, early 60s, but his son was with him, uh, really rocking it out. It was pretty cool to see two generations really uh, loving music and playing great tunes. Uh, never gets old. Never gets old. It's a little better than pop music and uh, rap. So I will uh, see you guys next week. Yeah, have a good one. Thanks Thank so much you. for making time for us, Howard. Have a good safe flight. Cheers. Okay, just bye. So Ed, here we are. We're waiting for our superstar guest here, and there's a few topics I wanted to touch upon. That uh, uh, we had a late cancellation before the show started, and uh, I'm just trying to pull up the information right here. Yeah, so you told I was going to be on, didn't you? You shouldn't have done. That. <laughs> yeah, no, it was just uh, like hotel Wi-Fi didn't work, so. Um, Basically, there was I, I touched upon it a little bit, but I really wanted to get your take upon it. Um, uh, first of all, before we do that, I want to finish off how you view this whole bubble versus bust, uh, or bubble versus, I guess, uh, boom uh, theory. Uh, are, are you? Do you have an opinion, like a market opinion? Yeah, well, I think I've, I've stated it. I think we're in a relatively early stage. I don't think we were in any, anywhere near boom. 
I think we're in the early stages of uh, an economic recovery. I mean, it's as we talked about breadth and, and the chart behind you, there is not the breadth. The reason there's not the breadth isn't because it's traveling on fumes, it's because it hasn't got going. Uh, and I may be co controversial in saying that, but I, I sincerely don't think it's got going. The fact the stock market may be relatively high it has nothing to do with it. Stock markets generally lead the real economy. And I think we're in a point here where the real economy is trying to get, will start to catch up the stock market, which is one of the reasons why I think the stock market is being struggling, is tired, is going sideways, because we need to see signs that the real economy is coming forward. And taper's all part of that. Janet Yellen said it herself, there are dangers of moving too quickly or too slowly. And she's playing a political game. Um, yes, they will come out of quantitative easing, um, but it won't be in a hurry. They will look for the data. We need to look for the data. And until we see anything different, we're going to get um, ups and downs the way, way we are. I, I am bullish on the global economy. I think um, it's got a long way to go. Um, in terms of, that's why I asked Howard the question, because I think we're exactly in the point in the economic cycle where you want to be buying real businesses and not stocks. You know, yeah, but that's what I, I wanted to touch upon AngelList, but I mean, uh, we've talked offline about AngelList, and I think it's it's one of the more interesting investing vehicles I, I've seen since, uh, well, I don't remember since, ever really. I mean, for people that don't know AngelList, it's basically a website for investing in early stage uh, startups, and uh, we, we, have, uh, we have this... Uh, uh, I'm just getting word that uh, we're about to uh, get another visitor in on our call, so uh, we just uh, we can talk a little bit about startups before that. And uh, early stage startups, there there is so much because of the barriers to entry that used to exist. It used to be such an issue raising money. Going public was the way to raise money, really. And then there was a venture community, and then there was, okay, that's fine, but then you have huge barriers to entry just by, like, your, your okay. environment, or who you know, pretty much. And uh, then you had to be in Silicon Valley, and that was, like, just, like, the economic cost, just, just rent was so high, and just doing basic things, and it was the cost of entry, the barriers to entry was quite high still. And now you have a place like AngelList, which is angel.co, and, I mean, you see companies, we, we talked about this a little bit, and you see companies that raise, um, that, I'm just pulling up the site right now, uh, you, you see uh, companies that raise 10 or, or at least millions of dollars on this website. And I just find it like completely amazing that that's even possible. And uh, can, can you... Tell us a little bit about this. Also, you have a political background, like how this is viewed. I'm just showing the website right now. Well, it's a democratization of investment, isn't it? It's just like um, it's a natural consequence of social media or, or the internet, which allows people accessibility to things that were previously not accessible. So it's people wanting to start up funds. We talk, I keep talking about the younger generation being forced into starting businesses. Suddenly, you know, they go to... Um, you go to institutions who, who, as you said about the old school tie, who don't, they don't necessarily fit the mold, so they don't get anywhere that way. And suddenly they have an opportunity of, of tapping people who are similarly looking for place money. So it, it is the democratization of investment, allowing people uh, who um, aren't going to invest millions and millions to invest smaller amounts in businesses that don't need massive institutional investment but need you know smaller amounts of investment so I, I look think at this look at this it's, it's, 3.6 uh, million dollars they raised online just look at these sums here this is not Kickstarter this is not small time I mean you're seeing these sums I'm showing here people are raising millions of dollars and everything is just some novel ID but and you see also here they're hiring and there's mm -hmm. there's a combination of jobs like this is job creation forget these rich guys who are just hoarding money this is job creation and it's just I find this and you see also where they're coming from they're coming from like uh, uh, Y Combinator out of New York the the famous uh, incubator but they're also coming out of uh, out of uh, like pretty much anywhere so we're gonna have a guy on now in uh, any minute now and his, the way he raised money and the way he did everything, I think it's just like perfectly modern. But look at this. I mean, they're, they're well on their way to uh, raise $5 million for a curated video on-demand platform. And, I mean, 
where would you go just uh, a little while back to do something like this? And I think well, this that's is my, this that's is my, proper innovation here. That's my point. You asked about the political side behind it. It is democratization of of investment, it, and it, in in a way, by making it more accessible, you make it stronger. You don't make it. Um, vulnerable to fewer hands that may manipulate investment or manipulate uh, finance in, in general. So it, it is a safer and it's certainly from a political point of view it is, is naturally appealing because it allows more people to get involved. The problem with anything like that when you open it up is the regulation that you don't find people taking um, uh, taking advantage of some of the investors and likewise the inv some of the investors, you've got to be really careful sometimes, some of these investors, some of these angels uh, are in a position to take advantage of some of the people they're investing in. You know, you yeah, go to but I, that was, uh, did you, if you continue watching, we had a quite a lively show last week after you checked out, then uh, Felix Salmon made that exact point. Um, like when you, uh, when you get into... I made the same point as Felix Salmon. Yes. You're uh, great minds think alike. But I would object to that to a certain extent because the angel environment, when you look at the... The, the ownership they take and how they behave. I, I would kind of disagree with that. I, I think they're possibly the best people you can have on your side, all things considering, yeah, unless you have a million dollars to spend. It's not a black and white world, is it? I mean, I'm talking no, about... Really isn't. I'm talking specifically... I've got some examples which I can't share online. I'm talk, But I'm thinking of examples where um, someone's looking for funding because they've got a great idea, they want, to, they want to grow the business and an angel comes along and says, yeah, I can help you, I can, I'm going to pay 25% in the dollar and they, they get their the slice of the action cheap. Uh, yeah. I think that's, that's taking advantage of someone when this could be someone slightly, um, uh, slightly straight, if you were like, more transparent, who's going to pay close to the fair value to help that business. But you know, I guess uh, there's got to be a bit of give and take. And that's my worry about any of this: is making sure that people aren't abused. No, but it's going to be interesting talking about uh, our guest, uh, talking with our guest now, and uh, because I know a little bit about his history and what he went through because he raised money recently, and I would say that once you have uh, a good enough ID, once you have uh, a solid enough business, and he, his back, so his name is um, I might be mispronouncing it somehow. His name is Hardeep Valia and he told me a little bit uh, about uh, how he raised money and his business and he made the presentation at Stocktoberfest, uh, the, the sort of festival that they have uh, in uh, San Diego every year to, to talk about like startups, finance, stock tweets, everything. And he made a presentation which was just staggeringly good. And when you see this guy being so so solid and so uh, having such a good product, I I really don't think he had any problems with venture capitalists. And I know exactly what he did, and he, he came in uh, fairly sort of, I guess the, for lack of a better word, just sort of fresh. I mean, just he didn't have any like big ties, he didn't have big names, he didn't have anything. And now you see who's backing him. It's Goldman Sachs. It's not just like anyone here. Goldman Sachs never backs anyone, and. When Goldman Sachs believes you and you're able to pitch them, I mean, you're doing something extraordinary. And uh, I think that it's one of the problems is there's too many copycats. So when you come in and you want you want money, then if you have a Snapchat clone, then yeah, you're probably not going to get a good deal. So I think there are people who are smart enough and strong enough to withstand. But I, I agree with you, there are predatory uh, investors. But I don't know if that's the norm, especially in the angel community. Well, it's, uh, there's always going to be a percentage anywhere um, who, that's what they're there for. They want to get something of value for as cheap as possible, and you can't blame them for that. It's just um, the, the, the question, and it's going to be a, a good question to put to our guests, is the extent to which there needs to be regulation in what, um, in what he's proposing and what, he, what he's doing. Um, it is going to open it up, uh, reducing costs like that. It's going to take a little. It's probably going to take longer because uh, we talked about these old school investors before. Um, you know, a large number of people I know won't, wouldn't go near anything like that because it's too new. It's too new generation, um, and they'll also be slightly nervous as well for the reasons I stated about you know um, uh, the 
some people taking advantage. So they want things to be very transparent, very clear, and very solid. And that's going to take time. Always takes time to establish trust. Um, but I'm sure the you know as you said the guys uh, got the backing of Goldman, and uh, it looks on paper like a pretty interesting idea. But when you talk about regulations, do you mean like because we we got some feedback from a viewer? Uh, do you mean uh, investor protection, or what are you talking about here? Yeah, I mean investor protection. Yeah, but apparently there is uh, quite an extensive uh, list of uh, laws to protect angel investors, and I'm I, I haven't had a chance to check it, so I'm just taking the the word of a Stockwitz reader. But uh, I mean, also you're coming from the UK. I'm from Norway, so we're from two widely yeah, different. Yeah, we have uh, a background, uh, and it says something that we have a background. Of one of my first thoughts is is, is regulation protection, whereas. Uh, <laughs> You know, you sometimes think, you know, there should be freer to do get ahead and actually. It's kind of uh, sad, actually. That's my first thought as well. Uh, and is that why? I mean, that's kind of like not being American. I mean, when you, when you have that that outlook, that uh, that uh, view on uh, the world. Gee, I mean, why? Because it's the first hurdle. You've got to jump in the UK and and Norway and the rest of Europe. If you want to do business, you have. There's a whole series of regulations you have to get over. My wife uh, runs a nursery business. And she just spends 75% of her time ticking boxes, sorting out the regulations because it's yeah. a massively regulated business, and it's um, you know, necessarily regulated. But uh, you you sometimes lose sight of of why you're in business because you've got too much paperwork, too many regulations to to overcome. Uh, but yeah. I mean, maybe let the I, I I did exactly that when we talked about it. My first thoughts were, well, what about the regulation? How do you protect the investor? How do you protect the investee? And then sit back and actually think about the idea. It's a great idea. Yeah. Don't kill it. Don't suffocate it before it gets going. Yeah, that's it's an interesting point. And uh, what do you think about because uh, the company we can introduce them before I, we're just uh, getting a. Um, uh, we're getting him on now. Uh, so the company that we're going to present now, we're going to have quite an extensive presentation uh, of a company called Motif. And uh, he did a presentation, like I said before, at Stocktoberfest. And the presentation was, I mean, I've, uh, I've never seen anything like it. He's basically laying out uh, a very real-world scenario where you can invest in stocks, but they are structured... They're structured like stocks, but they behave like uh, they behave like um, uh, ETFs and highly specialized um, uh, adjustable ETFs. I mean, this is U.S. only right now. Uh, they might be European, but right now they're U.S. only, and and you can trade 30 stocks for 10 bucks. And when you hear this, it sounds almost too good to be true. What do you think about this from? Um, from a trader's point of view, if we, we just leave the regulations alone, what do you think about that? Oh, that's good. It's liquidity, isn't it? You immediately, if you're allowing more people to come into the market, you do several things. The first thing is you allow more people to come in and take advantage of, of what's going on. If there's economic growth, their ability to invest, even if there's um, bust, they got a chance to, to go the other way and, and, and pick companies that will be, um, you know, do well in. in in depression or, or whatever, so it's it's good it's good news to allow more people to be able to have access to, uh, to the opportunity of becoming one of the billionaires, if nothing else. What it also does is provide liquidity. As a trader, the one worst thing you the thing you always stay away from is an illiquid market. There is not the opportunity to get involved and get out. If you want when you want to get out, then um, you know that's bad news. So it's, it's what do you think about the angel style of investing? Like, like uh, I didn't have a chance to ask Howard about the the liquidity issue. What do you think about that from your point of view? I mean, you have a very, very like different point of view from him. Uh, what to what extent? You've frozen, by the way. I don't know. If that's yeah, it. I realize that. Uh, Caught your best side there. The, um, the liquidity point. Uh, yeah, was it bad? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. What do you think about that? About angel investing. Yeah, in terms of liquidity, is that a non-starter for a person like you, uh, or is yeah. it exciting because there is a great, like, there, it's a great story to tell? Because I think the the main reason why people are so right now there is uh, over I think a thousand people who become millionaires overnight from the Twitter IPO. 
uh, not everyone is selling, you have some lock-in, wow. you have all this, but people become rich. Yeah, and yeah. everyone becomes an angel investor. I mean, I know personally people who have sold the company and their first reaction is angel investing. And uh, so my question is, what, what do you think? Oh, I think, uh, brilliant. I mean, I'm sorry if that, that point hasn't come across. Creating more access for more people into investment, into financial markets, provided they're not uh, open to abuse, you said putting regulation aside, I think it's a great thing. And it's, it's not only a great thing for them, but it's a great thing for, for the markets generally to provide liquidity, but also to provide um, greater opportunities. You're yeah. giving people, and this motif concept is giving people greater flexibility. In other words, and if you give people greater flexibility and therefore liquidity, you give them the more, more incentive to invest because they can move around when they don't like certain things, they can also move out and it's not going to cost them too much. Going back along, going 20 years ago, you know, you get into some markets or, or some ventures, you know, you had to think long and hard about getting involved because, not because you didn't like it so much, but if you wanted to get out, how do you get out? Now when you provide liquidity and greater opportunity to more people, there's more likely to be a willing buyer on the other side of your transaction. So that's a good thing. But also that, I mean, looking at your background, we don't normally talk so much about fractals, which is your sort of uh, style of investing. Uh, if you talk about, so uh, if, you, if you read the, the investment book by um, Jack Schwager, the, the f I think it's Market Wizards, one. yeah. Yeah, I think it's Market Wizards 1. I mean, if you haven't read it, 1 yeah. through 4, total must read. I mean, it's and like an education. Too, yeah. Especially the fourth is a very good one if you want to know uh, how hedge funds work. <laughs> and forget about CNBC, forget about the 13 Fs. This is how it actually works. And, and they tell you very frankly and how, like, quite candidly how it works. And, and Jack Schwager is a brilliant person on his own. Uh, but in the first book, which uh, um, there's someone who, um, uh, who mentions something interesting that I never thought about in terms of trading where the, the fact that you're able to envision like the euro dollar at 2 from now on or the, the oil price going to 600 or uh, Tesla going to 50,000 or the fact you're able to think that is a huge advantage and when you, I wanted to ask Howard this question but I mean it's almost better to ask you uh, f for your point of view uh, because oh, I, I, I do nothing but think in those terms, yeah, yeah. No, but if you look at a guy like Howard or a guy like um, uh, any early stage Facebook investor or whatever, and the guy is able to see something people are not just by the fact he has imagination. What do you think about that? I've, I've never heard anyone made that point in terms of trading, and people talk about levels and Fibonacci, whatever. I don't care. What's <sighs> interesting is the trading person who's able to much. see some yeah. big number and benefit from it. Trading is too big a word because, uh, and it encapsulates so many different styles. Uh, a lot of people who can make uh, good money by not having a view, by just trading the market. You take, you know, bits and pieces out of the market every day, or you know, all year long, and do seriously well. There are also people who make serious amounts of money once in a while by having the big view and getting it right. Um, and you know, to say that you should have a view or you shouldn't have a view begs the question what type of trading, what type of investing you're going to do. Um, and it's, you know, I had this conversation earlier about you play to your strengths. If you're someone who can see the wood for the trees, if you're a Howard who can see, you know, bigger picture, who can, who's proven to be right on some of the big picture ideas, then you stick to the big picture because that's where you'll get your return. If you're not someone who's got that, I was going to say imagination, but it's really insight. Um, or luck, let's be fair, there's always a bit of luck involved, then if you haven't got that, then you maybe need, you know, you need to focus perhaps on, on the nickel and diming. That still can make you a fortune. It's just a different approach. Um, what so do you I, would not be, I wouldn't approach. be overly prescriptive. Um, Is your approach working? My your approach? approach? Yes. Well, I, I cover the range necessarily in what I do, So, but yes, what I, I do is... Um, in terms of fractals specifically, is is a very exciting area that going from strength to strength. And in terms of trading and swing trading and bigger picture, I talked a lot about what's going on in the yen this week. I'm heavily short, sure, and it's working beautifully. A lot of it based on fractals, not just on on uh, 
comparison, say, with Dolly in 1989, and before people jump on me, yes, I know it's Paul Volcker, it is different, but it's actually the price action it is similar, and it doesn't matter that, you know, there might not be the same fundamental reasons from the terms of price action, it is working and delivering. Um, so, so, yes. Um, do I need to have a big picture view on, 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 you know, do I need to see the next 25% in dollar yen to take that view on some real fundamental move? No, I, I can rely on my, my practice. But you understand my, my reason for bringing that up. I mean, uh, when you're trading, uh, especially when you're entering trading, you understand something very quickly, I think. And the fact that trading is unbelievably hard because you have a binary outcome. And uh, I think a lot of people... I think charts kind of kill it for s some people mm -hmm. because it, it it's a crutch and uh, it's Sorry? it's a crutch. a crutch. I think I yeah, think yeah. levels and charts uh, might become a crutch because if you I, if you I practice today, so especially my, like I look at myself I'm a horrible trader just flat out I have to tell you and I, I tried being a trader and I, I it didn't work for me because I think. Mm -hmm my balls and my imaginations were inadequate and or the opposite uh, or the opposite too many people I, there's some obvious no ones. actually this was this was, both were okay. inadequate <laughs> and uh, I was looking at um, uh, I was very early in the dollar yen move uh, before Christmas like that's uh, right before I just gave it up I just didn't want to do it anymore and uh, it was it was very interesting when I look at it like trying to understand what's happened why it happened to me and I think the reason was um, uh, I was unable to imagine a world with the dollar yen at like 110 or something. Mm -hmm. I wasn't able to imagine uh, uh, things happening. I could hear them talk. So if you take like now, if you compare dollar yen uh, with whatever Abe said before the election and after election, uh, and you'd look at the uh, you look at the, the trade agreement with Europe and US, it's kind of similar. It's huge, it's hard to decipher, but it's apparently quite uh, US positive. But my brain doesn't work like that. I cannot imagine huge moves based on yeah. these, even though I think they're true. Same okay, with, uh, with the Shanghai Euro free trade zone. It's just the imagination of that. I'm, I'm just wondering how you view that. Well, you don't get big moves, in my opinion, seriously big moves, without some sort of fundamental justification. You can't, you know, it's difficult to imagine why a market will move 25% or even more um, uh, without some sort of fundamental trigger, unless it's possibly the reaction, counter-reaction to a previous fundamental move that went too far, as that's always... That's always possible. Oh, but one of the um, what you're talking about is perspective, and to the extent that fractals provide perspective, a chart provides perspective because you can go back in history and say, look, you know, if you look at what Dolly Yen's done more recently, forgetting the rally we saw, the monster rally in the last two years. Prior to that, we saw a very dull Dolly Yen market. If you go back in history, 20, 30, 40 years, Dolly Yen moved. Yeah, it seriously moves, and there's a serious amount of money to be made and lost. Now, to bring that back to um, market wizards, one thing, one of the recurring themes throughout all of those books is the preservation of capital. Now, that's where a lot of people, newbies, if you like, um, who enter the market, don't focus. They need to preserve their capital, and if you've seen move, violent moves like that, you don't let your losses run. You don't let you run into a situation where you could take out the entire capital. You know, you get out and you take take the hit, take the loss. And if you've seen violent moves, then you start to recognize um, the possibility of a violent move and you get out. You don't let it run and run. To the extent that it's an interesting point actually, because what you're talking what I think you're alluding to or was alluding to was templating trading styles an approach to trading. Which is actually I'm talking about templating, taking history of a market and saying it's done something similar before, let's project that forward and try and trade that. You're actually saying, put that aside, actually template how people trade situations like that. And that's that's quite important, it's quite interesting because from a fund, from an investing, from a trading point of view, I'd argue it's not just the idea you need to think about, but it's also how you react to that idea in terms of a trade or investment. Um, Again, going bringing it yeah, back. Yeah, but to that isn't that what you control in trading, yourself. 
what you should control, yes, I mean, first and foremost, control yourself. First and foremost, know what you're doing. First and foremost, protect yourself, pre preserve your capital, easier said than done. But don't, you know, don't risk uh, how I talked about it, you're being underinvested, people being overly margined. You don't get in a situation where that can happen. You just don't allow it. You know, anyone um, talk, talking about quotes, Jesse Livermore was saying about uh, don't ever accept a margin call. But can we talk about that? Because we are obviously waiting for our uh, our uh, superstar uh, guest here, and I, I'm guessing he's in a meeting. It's actually his birthday, so I wouldn't blame him too much. Too much, but. Uh, I was trying to call him uh, uh, bet uh, between, uh, like wh while we're talking here, and it's just he's a little delayed, but that's fine. But there, there is there is quite a few things I want to talk to Ed about, and and one is the the fascination with Jesse Livermore. Anyone who follow you on Twitter knows your uh, you uh, love the the Livermore quotes, and I mean I do too, and. Uh, Okay. I, I just find the guy so current. I mean, that may sound a bit strange, and anyone who doesn't know Jesse Livermore, I would thoroughly. If you're interested in trading, then you must read *Reminiscence of um, a Stock Operator* because uh, it's got so much insight. Not just from a, you know, it's yet another trader writing about trader, but his his no, comments. It's not, is, it's not yet another trader. It's something. It, it, and it's it, not because and as people, current as Sherlock Holmes is current, right? Isn't it? Well, Oh, well, I wouldn't. I'd say he's a lot more current than Sherlock Holmes. I think Sherlock Holmes is incredibly current, so that's what I mean. But anyway, uh, okay. continue. Yeah. No, but Jesse Livermore is, is where he's, he's interesting. Is um, yeah, he's he's current to the extent you can apply what he says. And what annoys me, irritates me a little bit, very is when I, you know, I do quote him quite a bit because he's got some real gems that apply to me and to everyone else every every day in the you know, trading markets. One thing that really irritates me. People say, "Well, he, you know, he lost a lot of money. He lost a lot of fortune. He committed suicide because he lost so much money." Yeah, he lost and made a lot of fortune. He's a story of hope for any trader who's lost money who can come back and do and make another fortune. He was a manic depressive, which I think is probably more likely the reason he killed himself. Even though he said he was a failure, he left five million dollars to his. He broke. He wasn't completely broke. No, it was five million five million dollars in his estate when he died. Uh, part of that, I think, might have been money he invested early. Because interestingly, he set up his wife and his son to the extent that if the uh, proverbia ever did hit the fan, that he couldn't get access to the money, that his family would be protected and looked after. Again, in a funny way, so I'm preserving their family capital to be look to look after his family in case um, you know he did blow up yet again. Uh, but what he says is is you know, it's timeless. He yeah. talks about. What do you think uh, is the best if you're gonna take one, one like, just basic concept that he brings up? Well, I, I so many that. things he talks about. Uh, just learn from your mistakes. Yeah. He, uh, make mistakes and learn, or. Well, you go. <laughs> you don't want to make mistakes, but when you make mistakes, sit back and see why you made a mistake and learn from it. Um, and and what he did. Was exactly that. He started as a kid. I mean, I said lie in some ways. He started as a kid in bucket shops, uh, writing up the prices as they went up, and tried. They started trading in bucket shops. You know, I know you, the bucket shops is something you're interested in. Uh, uh, so you've got some uh, stories to tell about some of modern day bucket shops. But uh, he was working about his shops, and he used to take them apart. They used to kick him out, and eventually he made it into New York and made it sort of trading properly. And um, again. He made and lost money time and time again. And but what he realized is that he one he had to preserve his capital. He had to minimize his losses. And the best best way to minimize your loss is to learn why you've lost money, to learn those lessons, and accept that you're going to lose money, but how you're actually going to make money. And one of his famous quotes is that you make money by sitting. It's the waiting, waiting for the position to go right rather than nickel and diming. Uh, and yeah. to your point about. But why can we talk about a little, uh, because there's a lot of talk about his success and I, I mean I love this story I could talk hours about his story and if you haven't read the uh, like film, of us, I, I yeah. don't know whether it would actually uh, would sell. No, it wouldn't sell. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> but but it would sell to the like the the six thousand yeah, people I, I that are. Yeah, I've read a hundred times. I've read the book. Yeah. All the books, a hundred, you know, I just keep reading them and rereading them. Because oh yeah, that's uh, I mean, reminiscence of a stock operator. I'm gonna bring up uh, just Livermore picture here. Uh, but reminiscence of a stock operator is, uh, I mean, it's 
it's almost hard to understand that it's not written in 1999 or yeah. 2009 because of the... I'm going to try and find a good picture of him to put up here. Well, what he wasn't was... a very attractive man, though. Oh, no, 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 not at all. I mean, <laughs> he looks really dull, uh, very dull. Um, but, yeah, and he's also... he's a, uh, it's, it's interesting looking at what... There you know, go. ...as one of the greatest traders... Is, uh, he was very fastidious, really fussy about some of his his habits. I love the story about how his driver would um, would go and bribe all the toll gates on the way from his his home to his office, so that he never stopped at a red light. He was allowed to go through without stopping, so he could read his paper, Brilliant. get to the office, and 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 go from there. Um, but there's some real, you know, some great stories of how he's made an uh, and lost a lot of money. He's notorious because he made. You know, he's called the the boy plunger because he he made serious amounts of money, obviously in the great stock market crash of 1929. But also um, he's made money elsewhere, and not just you know in in buying um, in buying stocks at the right at the right time, catching earthquakes and. But what was his big win? His big windfall. How much it was? No, I how, what was it? I I, I'm how, not sure. I know that actually. The 1929 stock market crash. Yeah, it was that. Yeah. yeah. It was him and. Uh, he made his first. Joe, Joe Kennedy United. was short. Was it? I. I think so. Yeah. I'm not 100 percent though. It might be. Yeah. No, but he's like from this unassuming person we're looking at on the screen. I mean, this is it, it, it's so much knowledge and it's so timeless. And uh, but but for you, how do you use that? Do you actually use that other than just like basic inspiration? Uh, great, yeah. The inspiration for me for for Jesse Livermore isn't how he trades because I actually trade quite differently. Is the uh, is the emotional makeup, the discipline? He he was extraordinarily disciplined. You have to be disciplined. You have to identify. This is where you learn how you make money and how you lose money. You obviously want to stick to the ways you've made money, and you use your discipline and your template. To repeat that, and you avoid the areas where you lose money. I I know full well the type of trades that I where I lose money, and it's when I have a big view, and I think it, maybe it's it maybe I don't know your own dollar yen example, but I can see it, it could be the same as one of my weaknesses is when you get something like a 10% move, you think well that's gone too far, I'm out, yeah. And you say thank you very much, I've done really well. Now you get cocky, I'm going to fade this. And then you sit with it, and the market goes against you. Not only do you lose money, but you actually fuel a move that you saw coming. And that, for me, I, I've learned my lesson. You don't do that. You, you know, I'm a swing trader by my nature, so I'm looking for one percent moves. But, but what, what do you feel about doing sort of complicated trades? Because I have a very interesting trade that I. Uh, so we had a guest on schedule for the show that had unfortunately had some Wi-Fi problems. So uh, I had to just get some of the IDs over the phone. And there's one that's particularly interesting that I, it's it, it appeals to me on sort of the human level. And I'm going to share something that might be an incredibly uh, valuable tip right now. But it came from a UBS hedge fund conference in London. So basically, there's um, a small company. Oh, not a small, like a conglomerate out of Sweden uh, called Hinevik. And it owns a company I've never heard of before, Solando. You heard of that? No. Should Sol I have that? Solando is basically, I'm going to pull up the website of Solando right now. So I'm going to pull up the, I don't know, the Norwegian site here because it, it um, it's the default for me. So it's, uh, it's doing, uh, so you see what it does. It's like clothes and... Yeah, so basically it's like uh, Amazon for clothes or whatever. And you see see what it does. And this, had, I, I did some quick calculations, but they're, they're having a geometric uh, re, like return curve. So they did, uh, I mean, they're growing so quickly, and but they're under the radar. I mean, nobody ever talks about Solando, and nobody for sure ever talks about Hinevik. Which is a small, like like a uh, under the radar blue chip kind of a Swedish company, and you can see what they're selling. I mean, they're selling sort of products at normal prices, and uh, there's nothing particular here. But the point here is nobody has figured out that this uh, that this company is 
is owned by Hinevik, it seems. Like everyone, I mean, people applaud um, people applaud uh, the new CEO for Yahoo's great fortune, but of course it's not that. I mean, Yahoo owns uh, uh, Alibaba or large parts of Alibaba, and uh, that's the real reason to buy Yahoo. And uh, I mean, and this conference, the guy shared it on stage, and this like sort of dull Swedish company just uh, floated out. And uh, uh, Ed faded a little bit away from me here, but I'm going to continue on. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry, can you give me, give me 30 seconds, yeah? Yeah, sure. I'm going to tune you out. So I'm going to continue on with this. And this, uh, this company is just such a fascinating ordeal. So basically, uh, uh, they did. I think they did about two billion in revenues in 2013, uh, 2012, and they're doing about three billion in 2013. This is clearly going to be a spin-off. It's going to be uh, maybe some kind of IPO, some kind of a, a buyout. I mean, they're they uh, they remind you maybe a little bit of Sappos. It's it's quite a close company. I mean, they don't maybe have the same corporate culture, but they're quite a Sappos company. And this company, Hinnevik, K-I-N-N-V-I-K, I think, owns that uh, owns this share. And if you look at the chart, I'm gonna um, uh, I'm gonna pull it up here one second. You look at the chart. I mean, it, I've never heard anyone mention uh, <laughs> this firm in any form of fashion. Uh, I don't even know how to find the chart for the Swedish company. So you look at the the one year. I mean, it's it's steadily growing, but this this firm here is uh, I, because we're supposed to have uh, Michelle on to explain this. So I don't have all the details, but if you look at the, the chart, it's it's quite a decent one year chart, and I'm willing to bet that a large majority of this growth is coming from this one investment. I mean, they're a conglomerate with uh, quite a high valuation, but still, I mean, this. Firm is a great proxy for owning uh, online retail, and uh, online retail is uh, is the key to um, I think it's the key to right now, and um, uh, you can just unmute yourself. Ed. I appear to have muted you. Uh, so. Um, Uh, anyway, my, my point being that these like gems are still possible to find, but uh, but uh, I mean they're they're harder and harder. And uh, uh, like Hinevik here, it, it, it's such a such an oddball company, and you you still have the possibility of these popping up in a in a hedge fund conference in uh, London, but. Um, it's few, I, I think it's few and far between. And another one that uh, there was three top picks in this um, in this conference. It was Alibaba, Solando, and Lending Club. Uh, and these three all have something in common, where you have a large cash flow going through the companies. Uh, just trying to get Ed back here. I appear to have muted him, and I kept unmute him. So uh, my point here is um, these companies, such as uh, Hinevik, such as Solando, so, uh, Lending Club, they're they're hard to reach. Uh, we saw a presentation at Stocktoberfest for a company related to Lending Club, which was unbelievable. This guy sold his firm to Google, and now he's basically making uh, he's basically making um, uh, bonds available to the general public by splitting them up. So they're they're becoming um, um, sort of a intermediary between uh, uh, lenders and le lendees, I guess. And it, it's just such an interesting company. There's so many companies going in this. It's like cash only business. And uh, if you look back 10, 15 years, like all these people that were promising cash, now we're seeing this amazing cash flow coming in. And uh, at this conference at uh, UBS, there was the, the three things people walked away from it was Solando, Alibaba, and Lending Club. I'm happy to have you back, uh, Ed. I'm sorry for muting you, but...
hey, you ran away there. You're not the first, don't worry. You yeah. certainly won't be the last either. <laughs> Uh, luckily, I can go on. <laughs> no, but there, there is there is something interesting happening now, and I, I can't put my finger on exactly what it is. But um, there is something about uh, cash flow businesses. So you have Uber, Airbnb, uh, like Howard talks about hotels tonight. You have uh, uh, like I just recently came across something called uh, uh, Kitchen something. It's like Kitchen Web or whatever. K- kitchen. I can't actually remember the URL. That's uh, basically, what about them? Uh, kitchen surfing, and uh, the company is the concept is you have like a dinner party. I'm gonna pull up the site here. You have a dinner party, and you need to uh, you need to like make food and do all the the hassly bits, and uh, it's like a huge demand. I mean, I'm not a uh, I'm not a bad chef, but I'm not a good chef either. So here you say, okay, I want. I'm in New York. Okay, they're not that widely spread yet, but they're not in London yet. But and then you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make. Um, uh, I need food. So there, there's a number of different ways of uh, of finding um, of finding chefs here. But basically, this is a a portal for chefs. It's a highly specialized need, and these guys have. Uh, so let's just take this guy. He charges 175 bucks an hour, and uh, you can look at his reviews. You can look at his dishes. You can look at his. Uh, so he does a minimum is five hours for 75, and he can uh, his group or his whatever can serve 250 people. So like for a wedding, for a party, for whatever, this guy will. Like serve it up, and then you he he has all this like this is his portfolio basically. So if you are a chef like this, it's like how the hell are you gonna sell yourself? Where are you gonna sell yourself? And this is the first time I've ever seen anybody do this. It's not the most common problem you have, maybe in the in the one percent, but like people like you and me probably don't need a chef every weekend. But well, I tell you one thing, Sorry, I could do without when it's dinner time is you showing food to me on online, yeah? I mean... <laughs> dinner time? It's 8 o'clock. It's 7 o'clock your time. Have a, have a, no, have but a the point man. is, I think it's such a beautiful thing what's happening right now where uh, underserved minorities like this, like people well, who... Like this is this is kind yeah, of a let's, posh let's thing. Look at, Let's not get into too much detail. I, th- I think there's a, re- I mean, there's a recurring theme through most of the things what I've been talking about with you and, and Howard, and it's, it's, it's through the internet is, and through the social media and the whole explosion of social media and accessibility is you're involving, uh, you're, you're smashing certain traditional ways of doing things and you're opening up to more and more people. You take... Um, you know, you take you're showing me pictures of food again. Um, you take the whole uh, cooking industry. I, I'm sorry, if that's probably not the right word. Chef industry, cooking industry. Thousands and thousands and millions of cookbooks are sold each year for recipes that you don't need to buy now because you can go online and you just tap it. So how are they going to how are they going to make a living? Well, they they start telling a story. They start doing something very different. Oh, that but looks what, good right there. For the first time in, in, in ever, probably since Mrs. Beaton wrote her fat cookbook, it's the first time ever that you're forcing um, cooks, the whole industry, to rethink what it does and how it presents it. And that means change, possibly and hopefully improvement. But people are thinking about what they're doing and how they can help more and more people, like the likes of you and me um, aspiring chefs. I mean, one thing that's interesting, I don't know if it applies elsewhere, but since the, uh, the credit crunch, since in 2008, there's been an explosion in two things. One is cooking programs in the UK, and the second one is comedy. Both are great, um, close to my, my, my heart. Um, and it's forcing people to do things differently and to recognize that people actually want something different. And it's not just the producers who are deciding what's being done. It's actually the consumer as well, because they're saying, I don't want to buy a cookbook. I can get it online. So now people are doing different things differently. And if you can anticipate... Or you can have a chef in your home and make yeah, all yeah. this. I mean, yeah, isn't this a little bit amazing? I mean, yeah, I mean yeah, yeah. You, you scuff it off like it's nothing, but I mean, what you're seeing here is it's like you can get a guy like this for a couple of hundred dollars. And like, let's say Thanksgiving dinner or something like a big, heavy, hard-to-do dinner. That's not new. 
Well, it, it's not new, it, but it's never been easy. I mean, I didn't know this. I, yeah, well, but that's my point. Now, it's for you're making it one. You're making it arguably more uh, more accessible, more available to people that uh, are now being informed of it to a far greater extent, so that more people will do it. And then that gives forcing that industry to do something a lot more. And here we have the man we've been uh, <laughs> waiting for for a while. <laughs> And we've been uh, hyping you. We've been pre-hyping you here. So um, uh, want to welcome our uh, special guest, Hardeep Valia. I never actually checked. Did I pronounce that correctly? You're on. Hardeep, can you hear me? We just got him on. Uh, one second here. Hey, what's the new? Uh, <laughs> one second here. We're just having some issues here with uh, getting him on. I don't know if he hears us, but we hear him. Yeah, yeah, one second. Hear. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna get him on because we've been waiting now for almost uh, 45 minutes. Uh, me and uh, <laughs> me and Ed has been we've been wax, waxing poetically about <laughs> about uh, all sorts of things, but uh, we're just trying to get him on now. So if you can bear us, with us about um, I don't know um, uh, half a minute or something like that. Thank you. You're not going to ask him about cooking, are you, Sri? Oh, I love that cooking site. Uh, I could tell. No, but it, isn't it? I mean, that's like the the reason to want success, almost. Well, you, you, it looks to me like you're trying to sort out your Christmas early. You're oh, getting the food good. sorted out, and you're getting the clothes from the uh, was it Orlando site, whatever it was. <laughs> no, but it's. I think it's lovely. Try eBay; uh, it's a lot cheaper, mate. Uh, so I'm just. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm a little preoccupied here, but. Uh, I think uh, I think uh, our guest is a little bit. Uh, I mean, he's, he's incredible. I know he's busy. I know it's his birthday, so we're um, we're be being a little bit forgiving here about uh, him having a hard time getting on. Uh, I'm trying to just SMS him and uh, hit him up yeah. in every possible channel. We were talking before the um, before even the pre-show. Yeah. Talking with Howard, some you know about about what um, about motif about some of the concepts behind it, and I was talking about the boom and bust motif. Is that do you think that'd be fair to put that to him? So uh, before uh, some people are watching, it's a little bit hard to understand, but uh, the motif is basically a style of investing, I guess. Uh, and uh, so if Being you you can create new styles of investing, or or uh, you can create a, almost like an ETF, and uh, and uh, if if you you can create quite simply these um, investment vehicles where you would invest in the upturn or the downturn, and um, uh, I'm sure he can answer this. So I'm getting a response now. He's just uh, finally I am uh, okay. He's rejoining us now. So we just wait for him to join. And uh, I mean we can see him, but he couldn't see or hear us. I think so. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry. We're still in very much in beta here, <laughs> so uh, he's gonna he's gonna hit us up now. Uh, but but the motifs. I mean, when when I went to s he was the first guy at Oktoberfest on the Saturday, the first uh, day of the presentation, and uh, he was the first guy to to present, and it was just so amazing what he had to tell because the story was so complete. And I mean, I have always had a problem with ETFs. Uh, where like exchange traded funds, and uh, there is about to come on now, I think. And uh, the pr the problem is that there is an artificial structure to it. There is some um, some uh, less than perfect um, uh, perfect parts to it. And uh, with motifs, which is what he's selling, it's it's not just it's not a product. It's it's a wrapper. So you buy you buy stocks. Later, you're going to buy uh, options. I'm sure you can buy bonds later even than that. But but they have a wrapper around it. So you want to 
uh, invest in a bust uh, sort of motif, or you can. Bust. And or, like or a boom or whatever. I mean, and you can adjust it yourself. If you think the guy who made the motif is bad, you can make it better. So I just... I just think it's well, such a natural way of investing. It's just co-investing, really. Well, let's say let's say you think the the, the global economy is about to hit the hit, you know is about to go bust, and you can um, you have there's a basket of uh, shares of companies that are more vulnerable than others to something happening like that, and you know you've got it, your little portfolio set up, but the um, the trouble starts in Asia, and so Asian yeah. stocks get hit more. You can switch your portfolio. Presumably, yeah. Towards more Asian stocks, and maybe as a consequence, you know, if you go the other way, you could even hedge it, perhaps with, you know, you've got a, a boom motif that has a selection, a portfolio of stocks that do particularly well when the economy or when the stock market is doing particularly well. You yeah. can also shift them if the U.S. is doing more better than others in the cycle. The U.S. is ahead. You can have, have gear it towards the U.S. and as things eventually hit Europe, then moves to Europe. Uh, can you hear us now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you have headphones or something like that? That would be nice. All right. Uh, sorry. Uh, I love the fact that you get to see how the sausage is made here. <laughs> <laughs> we have no mixers yet, and we have, we're just going live on the Google Plus here, so... Uh, do we have you here now? Uh, yeah, hold on one second. Let's see here. Is this better? Can you hear me? Yeah, no, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we have some echo with my voice, but it's fine. We want to listen to you. So, can you introduce yourself? I mean, I tried to pronounce your name, but I think I butchered it a little bit. So, can can you do it? And can you say a little oh, bit about it's, who you it's, are? It's easy. It's it's phonetic. It's Hardeep. That's as close as we need to get. Hardeep Walia. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Motif Investing. So, uh, in San Diego, you were the guy who kicked off Stocktoberfest. Uh, the presentation sort of festival and that Howard throws every year. And you subsequently blew the mind of every single person in the room. <laughs> and you continued to be the best presentation we saw. And I just want you to kind of just talk a little bit about motif, what motifs are and how it works. We really want to let you talk and maybe give a similar presentation to what you gave and maybe do some screen sharing and show that. Oh, absolutely. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for the kind word. So Motif is an online broker with a catch. Uh, we don't want you to buy individual stocks. Uh, we want you to invest in the ideas behind them. And, and, and what is an idea? An idea is frankly anything. It can be cloud computing, water shortage, too big to fail financials, a natural gas glut, US shale oil. It could even be an asset allocation model or a trading strategy. We have a motif called buying the dip that goes through every week, looks for the most beaten down stocks and then rebalances every week. And we allow investors uh, to act on these ideas through a product that we call motif. And a motif very simply is a thematically weighted basket of up to 30 stocks that you can purchase in a single click for the cost of a single stock transaction, $9.95 to buy 30 stocks in real time. You can put as little as $250 to work. You can put a million dollars to work. Our customers like to think of us as a no-fee customizable ETF, but thankfully we're not a fund. Um, so you actually own the underlying securities. We have a, a, a ton of patents in real-time fractional share trading. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we, we've been at it about three years. Uh, we, we're a venture-backed startup. Uh, we're very fortunate. Had some very notable names uh, on our board. Arthur Levitt, former SEC chairman. Sally Krawcheck, senior banking executive. Um, and, and, and like any other Silicon Valley, we're always trying to disrupt uh, the industry. And one of the things we did recently is uh, we started by building these motifs ourselves. Uh, it took our team of ex-hedge fund and ex-quants uh, 
a year to build 120 motifs. And then what we did la uh, on February on, on CNBC, we announced uh, the launch of our, our motif creator uh, program where individuals, you, you all can go out now and build your own motif. Um, and so we, it took us a year to build 120. It took our customers four and a half months to build 15,000. There are actually more motifs than there are ETFs and mutual funds in the U.S. And what we've just announced, and it's actually uh, uh, just last month, is now this royalty program where essentially if you were to build a motif, if Howard were to build a stock to its motif, for example, anytime anyone purchases that motif, Howard would collect a royalty payment. Uh, anytime anyone buys a custom version or rebalances that motif, Howard would pick a dollar royalty program. And we are the world's first investing platform made truly social. And we're very careful when we say that because we allow people to share the right amount of information with whoever they want. So there is this notion of a social graph married to an investing graph. You know, I trade energy and, and text uh, motifs. Um, and with my trading friends, I want them to see a, a certain set of information, a very different information than what I want to share with, say, my wife when we're talking about our retirement strategy. Uh, and so that ability to control the information is something quite, quite unique. Can you show us? I mean, I don't know if you know how to share your screen. It's on the left. The uh, on the left. On the top. I I got it here. And right. uh, because the 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 UI. Can you see my screen now? Yes. All right. So let me let me let me walk you through. Um, and this is uh, my Roth IRA. So this is a, a, a real real account, and we'll show you some real trade execution. Um, and so one of the first things you'll notice when you come to Motif is you're not going to see, you're not going to be inundated with stocks or bonds or, or fund products. Uh, let's start in the catalog for a second. What you're going to be surrounded uh, with is great investing ideas. Ideas you've probably heard or read about. Um, and these, by the way, are real returns. These are not back to, these are actual returns uh, realized by the motifs. So you can see here uh, biotech, you can see rising interest rates. Uh, fracking, very popular one these days. Uh, water shortage. Uh, and a lot of people are using motifs to answer, especially the media, to answer interesting questions about the market. For example, does it pay to lobby? This is a lobby weighted. We'll get into the weighting methodology. We spend a lot of R&D on weighting methodologies. So I was having dinner with a congressman in DC, and we got into a passionate debate on whether it pays to lobby. Uh, I said, wait, there, there is a motif for that. We can actually answer that question. My wife were arguing, we have two very young girls, and we're wondering whether women make better CEOs than men, and there's an answer to that question. But, but, but some of these motifs are very thematic. Some of them, like bulletproof balance sheets. Uh, we've got a lot of technical motifs as well, low beta motif. Um, and you can, as an exercise, learn a lot about a stock. I'll, I'll type, I used to be a, an exec at Microsoft. If I type in Microsoft, I can very quickly see the themes that are associated with Microsoft. Uh, democratic donors, it's a gay-friendly company, um, it's got a bulletproof balance sheet, fossil-free, it's a democratic donor. Uh, I can also type in a theme that I might be interested in. Water. Do I want to invest in water as in water shortage? Water as in utility bills? Um, uh, uh, we had a, uh, a fracking motif that where the largest consumer of water is in fracking. Uh, and so you get different ways to play uh, and, and learn about different investing strategies. This is the one month return. You can see what's different, what's been trending up lately. Um, but let's let's pick a motif for a second. An easy one to understand to get your, your, your hands around is our biotech motif. So when you come to a motif landing page, what you see is a very simple blurb on what the motif is, right? What is the thesis behind this motif? And when you ask most people, whether professional or individual investors, when you think about uh, biotech, what is the first thing that comes to mind? It's like, what disease, what therapeutic class are you going after? And you can see cancer, infectious diseases, autoimmune, the tool companies that provide research tools to the industry. And you can hover over individual stocks and see how they've done. And we send you to Yahoo, Google to do as much individual stock research as you like. We'll be doing our own pretty soon. Um, when you come up and look at the performance chart, you can see how this motif has done uh, against the S&P 500, and you can see we get far too much credit 
for being stock pickers. We're actually not stock pickers. You can think of, of this as a Peter Lynch meets Jack Bogle. We create index products around the motif. And so even though you have a 30 stock motif, it's designed to replicate a much larger index. And if you, if you were curious about how these motifs get built, you can see in the macro, the Uber index, there are 99 stocks. And these 25 stocks are designed to track the risk return behavior of the broader index. Much like when you buy a Russell 3000 ETF, you don't always own 3000 stocks. We use sampling technology to minimize tracking error. But as you can see here, this motif has done really well against the S&P. Uh, you can type in other stocks. I'll just make it easy and pick Microsoft. Um, that may, may or may not be related. Other indexes, and you can see how this product has done. And if you like what you see, you can click buy. But I was showing this motif um, not too long ago to a group of doctors who told me, Hardeep, you, you will never know as much about biotech as we do. And I said, you're absolutely right. What do you want to do? So they said, look, we know what's happening in, in cutting edge research in biotech, and we're making a lot of progress in cancer. So you can move these sliders here. You can move them around to change weights. And they wanted to go increase their weight in cancer. Um, they didn't like Vical in Incorporated. They wanted to take that out. But they argued there was a stock called Diax at the time that they wanted to add. So if you click Add Stocks, uh, we talked about those 99 stocks in the index. These are the stocks in the index that didn't make the motif sample. And so you can click Diax, which is a cancer company. Click Add. It shows up in the right category. And you can now give Diax some weight. Now, they wanted a lower exposure to infectious diseases. Right now, these sliders, by the way, stop at zero. Uh, early next year, you'll be able to go negative, i.e., go short a sector or a specific stock simply by moving these sliders. We've heard from a lot of our retail customers that they want to short. They just don't know how to do it. And we're going to make it. You'll see a repetitive theme across our product, which is it's simple yet powerful. And, and so you can lower this. You can see how the doctor's version uh, has done, which is the pick line versus our motif. And when you click buy custom now, you bought a custom version of our biotech motif. You click buy. You can put as little as $250 to work. You can put a million dollars. Um, you see the preview. We're pulling in price quotes. And you're, you're buying a lot of uh, fractional shares. That's uh, Part of what we heard is a lot of people naturally think dollar investing when it comes to buying a, a product. Uh, they can't always think share weights and we'll send this product to market. And I have just bought the 25 stocks in that motif uh, in real time. It cost me $9.95 and I could have put very little. I could have put a lot into it. One last thing that's worth uh, calling out here um, is if you look at the social aspects of our product, we can tell you on this motif, for example, 65% uh, of, of our, our, our users think that are bullish on this motif. Uh, you can see 74% bought the motif as is, 26% customized it. Now pretty soon uh, you'll come up here and we'll show you the wisdom of the crowd customization. Don't be surprised to find out that the people that can the customize the most are typically domain experts. So you'll see a lot of our doctor uh, uh, customers customizing this. You'll see engineers customize our cloud computing motif. Uh, and you can see 1,939 people are watching this motif. These are my friends or, and family members. Uh, I won't click on them for privacy reasons, but if I were to hover over them, I could see they actually own this motif. Uh, and if I were to click, I would go to, I'll show you my profile for a second. And you can see what they've been up to. But you control the amount of information you want to share. So you can see we just bought this motif. Uh, you can see what other activities I've been doing. And I can share uh, with my friends. And we have two concepts of friends. We have friends uh, where you can create a broader setting. So all my trading buddies, some of our customers are in here. And, and what they get to see is what I'm watching. Right? They can see motifs that I'm watching. They can't see motifs that I'm invested in. And that's just for compliance reasons. Um, for, for my investing circle, and that is a small group of people that includes my family members and uh, compliance officer and, and friends um, and board members, uh, they can see what I've invested in. And what we show you is not necessarily a dollar worth, but you can see my real holdings. I've, I've, I've owned biotech for 17 months. I'm up 90%. 
and, and you can see what I own, how long I've owned it, and what my return has been on those motifs. So going back to the actual motif, so what you're able to do uh, on, on, on the social tab, the what others think tab, is really get a flavor for what people really think, what they're writing about, other related motifs. They publish a lot of content here, so it's a really nice way to keep up to date uh, on the motif itself. And, 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 and now, if you were to go to my home page, you can actually get the dashboard view of look across all my investing, uh, how am I doing, what's happening on the platform today. And what you can see today is, you can see, oh, it's been a really good day. Um, and you can see today, 70%, 69% buys, 31% sells. Uh, the investor sentiment today uh, is bullish. You can see what other people are reading, other motifs that are trending. 3D printing's up 19.9% uh, for the month. Uh, and you can get a flavor uh, of what's happening. If you look at my positions tables, you can see this is my Roth IRA, as I mentioned. You can see what motifs uh, I actually own. And this is a view you see just because it's a demo. It's not a view you'll see uh, from me if, if we were on our social uh, platform. But you can see I have about 25 motifs in here. Uh, motifs. Uh, uh, there's Howard's motif right there, um, and um, the, I have about 25 motifs in here. But if you click stock view, you 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 get a sense of what peering behind the motif layer. What do I actually own? And you can see for for 200, 250 dollars, I own thousands and thousands of stocks, and I can sell individually. If BP were in here, and I wanted to sell BP across all my holdings. Uh, it would cost me $4.95 to sell BP across everything that I own. It's a nice way uh, to get out of a, a holding very quickly. And we also give you a sense of your allocations. Um, and so you can see here, here's my allocation. You can drill down into specific sectors, subsectors, and track down every penny, out, every fractional share, where your holdings lie. You can see it by sector as well. So you can see I have exposure to financials and basic materials. Uh, and you can also see by motif as well. You can see I have a, a large position in a, a, a technical strategy, buying the dip. Um, you can see I, I like to drink a lot of caffeine. I have a quantitative easing strategy in Japan. Uh, we have an IBD motif that allows you to trade investors business dailies, uh, proprietary uh, stock model. Uh, we just partnered with them last month to enable that. And so you get a very good feel for, for the kinds of things I'm interested in, but you also get to, to view it at an allocation level. So the, the, as I mentioned, these are the motifs, and this section of the motifs that we built. You can, lots of different ways to find them. It gets really interesting, even if you look at traditional models. So one of my professors, David Swenson, wrote an interesting book on Ivy League endowments. There's a motif for him. Uh, we allow you to trade fixed income, so, uh, and we use, um, we use um, our um, bond ETFs to help us with fixed income. And so we'll pick on this one, for example. This is a fixed maturity motif. And what's really good about this motif is you can, using those similar slide outs, uh, sliders, excuse me, um, adjust this motif. If you wanted to take the duration out, of, out on this motif, move these sliders around, bring in 2014, and see how you would have done. Now, obviously, you would have done well there. And, 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 and you can vary, we've got a similar motif for a, a fixed income portfolio built around credit risk. And again, pretty soon you'll be able to go short, so do some really cool stuff around that. Um, and, 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 and there are lots of applications of what we do. Uh, you know, we've been working with some media companies to actually monetize content for them. You know, you think about the model, a lot of this content can be federated, uh, and we allow you to, to, do, to, to actually, uh, for content creators to make money out of this. Um, Another thing is we've got customers who are just buy and hold. They want to go rebalance once a year. Uh, this is essentially a low fee retirement target date product. Um, you can, can go in there. It follows a natural glide. And we will do a lot of the rebalancing for you for the motifs we own. Now, these are motifs that we put together. Uh, we have a very rich uh, ecosystem of customers that are building motifs. Uh, as you can see, these are actual returns that are doing really well. So Nanner Growers is up 53.1% for the month. Uh, and you can go in, and similarly, you can type in something you're interested in. 
a stock that you uh, uh, want to follow and find motifs that we have not built but we've enabled through our publishing platform. And, and the creators of these motifs obviously get a royalty, but for you it's immaterial. Whether you buy our motif or you buy one of our customers' motif, it still costs you $9.95 uh, for up to 30 stocks. And if you click on Build Your Own, and I'm happy, I'll stop here for a second, I can show you how easy it is to build a, a motif. Uh, but I want to make sure um, um, I stop and, and give you a chance to ask questions. I mean, I've seen this presentation once before, and it's so good. I don't know really what to say. I mean, uh, can you try to turn on your speaker or something? Because everything's coming back. Okay. All right. Um, can, is it working now? Can you I, hear me? Yeah, it's... No. Okay, I'm going to just right. go anyway. Uh, so, but basically, you're, um, w what you're doing here is, is disrupting uh, something like $1.3 trillion industry. The ETF industry is all about this, but they're structured. It's kind of like fake products almost. And when you look at this, you own individual stocks. It, what, what do you think about this? Oh, I'm so sorry. Ed, Ed checked out uh, in the middle. I think he had connection problems. But can you talk a little bit about the ETF disruption? Yeah, I mean, the, the um, you know, Motley Fool wrote an interesting piece uh, asking whether we will do to ETFs uh, uh, the same way what ETFs are doing to the mutual fund industry. So $1.3 trillion, it's actually coming out of mutual funds. And there are a couple of advantages we have. Uh, over ETF. One is we're completely transparent. We're zero cost because it is like a no fee product. They charge basis points. Um, you know, we're, we're launching pretty soon a, a social motif. Uh, there is a social ETF, but they charge you 65 basis points. Uh, what you see is what you own. You can customize. And there are a lot of interesting scenarios. You know, some of our clients come from Twitter and Facebook and they want to buy the S&P 500, but they don't want to buy more uh, Facebook and Twitter stock because they have enough exposure there. So there's some fascinating applications, and we don't have some of the liquidity problems that a lot of ETFs, because you bu you're buying uh, direct purchasing uh, uh, individual stocks, but we're doing it through the motif layer, and a lot of ETFs, six, you know, I think I've read statistics in, in the FT that 65% of all ETFs fail within the first six months if they don't get to a 100 million in minimum assets, and there are always problems with liquidity for some of the smaller ETFs. Uh, ETFs are a market where the big get bigger and better, but the smaller ETFs, especially the thematic ones, you know, we're, we're, we're cheaper than them, we give you the ability to customize, and, and it is a different way of thinking a, 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 about ETFs. But do you think that there, there is a number of issues we can, uh, we can touch upon? But I, I want to go a little bit back on how you got started because it's kind of an interesting story on how it was for you. I mean, you're an ex-Microsoft guy and yes. you've gone on record to say you're a big Balmer fan. <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am a big fan of Steve's, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, that's an unusual, uh, I've not, not met that myself and I'm happy for you and him and everyone. but. Uh, how do you go from being a guy in the middle of Microsoft to running the most fascinating financial startup I've ever seen? Well, I, mean, I think, um, I mean, uh, some of it gets very personal. My, my, um, I loved Microsoft. I don't know if I would have left. My mother was terminally ill, so I took a leave of absence, and that was what got me out, and then I did a lot of, uh, after my mother's passing, a lot of thinking uh, about what I wanted to do. And, and, you know, this is post-2008. You know, we had come out of this financial crisis where $8 trillion of individual net worth, retail net worth in the U.S. evaporated, right? And so there was a lot of pain. And one of the, 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 the worst points of that is those people who lost $8 trillion in net worth had to pay $376 billion in fees, right? I'd also naturalized that year, and I came out of my naturalization saying that's not very American. Right, this notion that you can lose that much money and get paid that kind of uh, fee basis. So, so we, we, it, it, that was on my mind. I'm a huge trader personally. Um, so now I can, my wife can't yell at me anymore because what I, when I say I'm work, trading, I'm actually working. Uh, before because I could never you get away raised with that. Uh, quite a bit of money there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, how much did you raise so, before we get? I'm sorry. In total. How much have you raised in total? 
So we've raised $51 million, uh, um, and, uh, and we've got the Tier 1 Silicon Valley investors. Uh, Norwest led our Series A with Foundation. Uh, Ignition led our Series B. Uh, and then Goldman Sachs uh, uh, did a strategic round in our company uh, a few months ago and led our series, uh, 25 million Series C. But I'm sorry, I, I uh, got you off. But I want to hear like how it got about. To, so, it's so, so it started. Uh, you know, a, a number of our friends were all techies at heart. We're all geeks. Uh, we were talking about um, cool investing trends. Uh, we were debating the rise of tablets, right? The tablet takeover of the PCs. Uh, uh, cloud rise of cloud computing, the mobile internet tsunami, and we were thinking about all these interesting ideas, and then we were figuring out how do you actually invest in them. And and when we did, um, when we were doing our fundraise, we used to ask people, individual professional investors, how do you invest in this, right? Not the device, but the mobile internet, right? It was on fire back then, still is. And when you asked people, <coughs> how do you invest in the mobile internet, they would all say Apple. Literally, we have professional investors saying, buy Apple if you want exposure to the mobile internet. <laughs> and, 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 and the mobile internet is obviously far richer than that. You've got the cell phone tower companies, the chip companies, the screen companies, the operators, and the handset manufacturers. There were no ETFs or mutual funds that gave you exposure to the mobile internet. The mobile internet motif was actually our first motif. And when we did the homework and the research on how do you truly invest in the mobile internet, you ended up with a broad exposure to the mobile internet supply chain, the value chain, and there were about 30 stocks. And that's, incidentally, the history behind why we ended up with 30 stocks. Uh, it was because when we solved that problem, there were 30 stocks in the mobile internet. And then when you tried to buy them at an individual broker, I had a, a, an account at a, 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 one of the large brokers, they charged me $10 per stock. So if I wanted to spend $5,000 $5, in mobile internet, I'd have to pay $300. That just didn't seem to work. And because there were no fun products, you know, there are all these interesting ideas uh, that come about that people can't act on. So then we went out and asked people, you know, what, what is it that stops you? And, and it was very simple. People know how to trade. People know how to come up with ideas. But connecting the ideas to the trade was a really hard problem. And that became the, the genesis of Motif. And, and one of the reasons, you know, I'm, I, I love Seattle. It was very hard to leave Seattle for me. Uh, but my wife uh, from LA, and she didn't like the uh, the whole uh, uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, we, we moved down to Silicon Valley simply because it's it's an amazing place for entrepreneurs. Uh, I don't know. My dad in India uh, still doesn't believe me that you can go into a VC's office and, and raise twenty six million dollars of PowerPoint. It it is a very magical place where people see your vision, uh, and we're very grateful to our our, our all of our investors, but our, our Series A investors definitely hold a special place because they took a big jump and, and big leap of faith and uh, in, in believing in what we were doing. Um, and, and that's kind of how Motif started. Um, and we've been at it, uh, you know, we were uh, started in September 2010. Uh, we launched our product uh, in June of last year. Um, and we've, we've had a, an amazing ride. It's been a lot of fun and, and, and we're very grateful. Can you say a little bit about scale, users, what kind of money is involved, and also yeah. what kind of role Goldman plays in this? Because Goldman is not usually involved with stuff like this. So, I mean, I'm sorry if I'm touching upon it. It's, I, I don't know yeah, if you so, can talk about it or not, but yeah, the no, Goldman absolutely. bit is so, so, so we don't we don't release stats, uh, broader stats. Um, we 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 have released, uh, and it gives you a sense of scale when your customer base can build 15,000 motifs in a short amount of time. That gives you a sense of how many people are using our product right now. And, um, and and I'm sorry, you were saying about Bogle? No, uh, about uh, like the, the the scale, the volume, but also about Goldman. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's Goldman very Sachs. unusual that Goldman Sachs goes into such a company. Can you talk about this, or is yeah? I mean, I, I can't comment, but what I will say is, you know, it was a strategic deal. This wasn't the VC arm, uh, and and you know, uh, we, we are obviously exploring a lot of things. What I will say um, uh, is. Early next year, you know, we, we, we have really three businesses right now. We have our retail brokerage business, which is the site we just went through. Uh, we have a business around build your own motifs. So content companies are going to use this. Imagine reading a story on shale oil or shale gas. Um, and today, 
uh, you can tweet it or like it, pretty soon you'll be able to invest in it. So imagine a, a story as far-fetched as uh, democracy movements around the world, and you think to yourself, wow, there's all these broken infrastructures, I'd love to invest in it. While you're reading content, where, you're, where those ideas get generated, we want you to be able to act on that. So we have a, a business simply around uh, content monetization, and that's a business we're moving pretty aggressively in. And then our third business, which we haven't announced, um, that's coming early next year, uh, we've got a lot of investment advisors that are going to use our product uh, to manage their, their business. And a lot of interesting scenarios around uh, yeah. wealth managers and, and financial advisors. A uh, simple one is they have a client who's worried about inflation. They can type into our search bar, worried about inflation, and a motif pops up called worried about inflation. It just makes the discussion with their clients a very easy one. So those are our three businesses, and so as we get into uh, the wealth management, the more B2B space, you're going to see us start to partner uh, with some very large financial institutions on distribution deals and a whole set of specific scenarios that I won't get into uh, right now, um, but that's, that's kind of where we're going uh, uh, next year. Well, Ed, uh, Ed, you haven't seen this before. I have seen this, and I talked to Ardeep before. Uh, no, I had a, can, you, can, can you tell us what you think about this? Uh, Hadi, hi. Yes. I'm hi. involved in markets. I'm a trader. I also advise and try to help other people trading. Very interesting, very exciting for a number of reasons. Unfortunately, I'm just, one thing I would like to do is stay on the national grid here because we had a power outage, so I missed a bit of your presentation. But can you um, let me see if I've got this right? You can create a portfolio of actual stocks, maybe smaller than the actual stock amount, but you can create a basket of 25 shares around one particular theme. And you create that motif and you invest in it, and then you can change it around if you want. Or someone else can pick up that motif and invest in it and change it around as it suits them. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, now on that basis then everyone can see all the other motifs out there. Is that right? No, so, so uh, if you create your own motif, you can elect to keep it private, okay. to share it within your community of friends, for example. So there are some motifs that, that people are very sensitive um, uh, to those motifs getting out there, so they can share it within their network. Uh, the other extreme is my dad, who's a retired uh, vascular surgeon. I can tweet him our minimally invasive surgery motif, he can adjust it, customize it, because he's a domain expert in, in invasive surgery, and he can tweet it back to me, and I can buy it off Twitter with a link off Twitter. And all of our followers can buy that motif, right? Because so we make the public scenario very, very uh, powerful and easy, but we also respect uh, privacy and, and make sure that people who don't want to share the motif don't have to. Okay, but there will be a large number that will be publicly available and presumably money will search out the best variation of the motif. That's human nature, I imagine that's the case. That being the case, you talked about uh, the next, the third area you're about to go into, about financial advice, and you use ETFs already for, for bonds and, and other markets like that. Isn't that a great vehicle for creating a fund? That's also why myself, I could create a currency basket based on certain ideas that I may have or not have at the time being, and saying this is the Ed Max hedge fund. It's a motif. Invest in it for 10 bucks, or a cost of 10 bucks, to invest 250 bucks or 1,000. Could you not actually be creating a, a hedge fund movement on a very small scale, on a very low unit? Yeah, I mean, there, 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 there are clearly a lot of applications of this. Um, you, you, uh, a lot of, you'll see a lot of cloning of interesting strategies that are out there, but, but the rebalance scenario is actually a pretty powerful one. So it's not just I can create a motif. Uh, I can distribute to retail customers, and I can essentially uh, rebalance my motif. I can actively trade a motif. The big difference between us and some of the other companies out there on that point is we don't do mirroring, uh, at least not for retail investors. We want retail investors to really understand what's happening. And so to the extent that you've got some professional manager that wants to create a motif, that wants to build a following, uh, they won't be able to take discretionary control right now at least 
um, because there's some there's some regulatory issues around that. Um, so what we do is we empower, but there's nothing to say that I'm a gifted manager, I want to build a following, uh, I can use the motif as a distribution tool to retail. And it's for, for the existing hedge funds, it's actually a great way for them yeah, yeah. to replicate and get mass distribution of that. Oh, that's exactly my point. You're creating a, you're opening up hedge funds to a large number of people, which on one hand would be brilliant and allow people so, to Sorry, I, I just have to... Uh, Hardeep, can you please plug your headphones into the headphones jack? Okay, yeah, I because tried it, it just turned. Yeah, okay, no, it's in on. the mic jack. Can you plug that into the headphones jack? Because we're getting all the audio back. Yeah, it's bad enough to hear what I'm saying once. Yeah, then twice. we lost him. Okay, now we lost Hardeep. I was just, it was very hard to follow the conversation because of the audio coming back to us. Okay. Uh, no, it was <laughs> that. That's kind of an unfortunate outcome here. <laughs> uh, Hardeep appeared to have unplugged something. Uh, no, but it's. Uh, yeah. You see my point. I mean, media. It's very interesting what he was saying, and it opens up a lot of possibilities for a lot of people. Um, uh, on one hand, it obviously it's, it's low entry, so it opens yeah. up to a large number of people. But the ability to shift things around, not just on your own ideas. But to copy other people's ideas, or or to look at other people's ideas, how they're moving things around, and you're going to follow the best. I mean, using the old adage about picking the top three mutual funds and just sticking your money year in year out um, uh, on the best performers, you could do the same thing to improve your your funds. But it it's it's, but it's not really a problem. I mean, that's like kind of the service in a way. Yeah, no, but it's optimizing. It's optimizing the whole investment practice. Interesting, but also potentially opens it up to the whole hedge fund industry. So uh, we're getting feedback no matter what, so we're just going to go with it. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, but is there? Can you say something about uh, the goals going forward? I mean, this is such a disruptive technology. Uh, so, so our, our our goals going forward is 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 really about distribution, right? We know. Uh, we have a, a, an interesting uh, mousetrap, uh, and one of the things we don't talk about broadly is we're a disruptive force, but it's also a very profitable model. We, uh, the guts and bolts of our system is a set of proprietary trading algorithms, so we're able to offer investors 30 stocks for the cost of a, what a, traditionally they would uh, uh, pay uh, for a single stock transaction, and it's actually an, it's a, it's a, it's a high-margin business for us. So for us, you're going to see us think about the applications of this technology to things where there are pretty high fee basis. Uh, a 401ks are a good thing. There's a lot of discussion going on in the advisor world right now about the cost of 401k fees, how those models work. Imagine a model where there's a no fee 401k plan, right? Or imagine a no fee 529 plan. Uh, ones where those models actually are very profitable, but they don't have to be offered through a, you know, these kind of high fee products. Um, and so you're going to see us partner with a lot of investment advisors. Uh, we're we're, we're um, very focused on partnering with investment advisors. There are a lot of companies that try to compete with investors, uh, investment advisors. We, we want to be their partner, and we see ourselves as a nice uh, a platform for them to use. And we've got lots of fascinating scenarios from intergenerational wealth transfer to, um, you know, smart... SMA products, the ETF wrappers, so you're going to see us get in pretty heavily into the investment advisor space next year. So I'm trying to type out the question. Do, do you have to be a broker dealer for this to work? Oh, we are a broker dealer, yes. We but are is, that, a, uh, is that part of the business model? You cannot yes. do this license? So, so, we, 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 uh, so uh, we are a broker dealer. We make money um, off the transaction fees. Uh, we make money off other things like net interest and, and margin. Those are typical uh, models of any broker dealer. Um, so, uh, but we also make money uh, of new products that we'll offer next year, uh, such as wh what I call a value add service. So I have a bunch of motifs. I want to harvest my tax losses. You know, we're going to pull out a, a put, literally a button will show up that will say harvest tax losses, and what it will do is it will automatically sell out all your losses tell you how much money you're saving on your, um, uh, your taxes, and then 31 days after the IRS wash rule expires, it'll reinstate your portfolio. So that won't be a 995 trade. It might be a 
$29.95 because we're saving you thousands of dollars. We'll have a, a lot of work around risk models, right? Uh, I may be in the U.S., but I'm worried about a banking crisis in Europe, for example. How do I hedge? I could be interested in our caffeine fix motif, but a lot of the success of that motif is driven by what's happening in Europe. So you'll see us offer some really sophisticated uh, hedging products next year. And the good news is we're going to make it super easy to use, just like we showed you the shorting slider, moving that into... We're, we're, we're really obsessed about usability and making financial products very easy. Uh, you're going to see very big brands start to license uh, their brands to motif, right? You could, you, it could be something like the Human Rights Commission uh, that's very concerned about, you know, uh, the, uh, human rights. There might be a human rights motif and it'll allow them as a nonprofit uh, to make money off their brand using a product like ours. So you're going to see a lot of uh, really cool, very different applications that you might not have thought of. But you can think of us as a consumerization of, um, you know, I kind of joke, uh, and please don't take this the wrong way, uh, it, the, the it, news in Europe to me is always boring, right? When I sit there and I watch the news, it's boring. And that's because it's the news. It's not supposed to be sensationalized. You, you hop over to the States and we do a good job of entertaining people as they watch the news. We want people engaged in their investing, whether they're a buy and hold investor Buy and hold in our mind becomes buy and sleep. So we want to find ways of getting people involved. The, the, the dirty little secret is if you buy 10, 20 motifs, what you effectively have is one of the lowest price index out there. You can build these asset mo allocation models. And so it gives you a nice way to understand. Think about a, a not so sophisticated investor who has five motifs. Uh, if you give them 150 stocks, they'll have no idea what's going on in, in their portfolio. But if you tell them it's healthy foods, it's cloud computing, it's too big to fail financials, pick two others, now they have a way of interacting with their portfolio in a way that they wouldn't thought of. And these, these applications are, you know, I, I write a lot on what I call real world investing. For example, I was in uh, Western Pennsylvania not too long ago. And I have a, as you noticed, I have a lot of shale gas and shale oil motifs. And I was reading at the time in the paper there was a debate going on around uh, uh, suspending uh, shale gas licenses because of worries about fracking. I, uh, our shale gas and shale oil motif is reserve weighted. It's geographically weighted. So that weighting methodology is really powerful. I could come home or on my mobile device, use those sliders and say Western Pennsylvania, move that to zero and take my money in Western Pennsylvania and move it to Eagle Ford, Texas, where they tend to be uh, a lot more oil and gas friendly over there. That concept, that scenario is so far-fetched, so hard to imagine with existing products. But the ability to do that, and that's why, you know, we always get called Peter Lynch meets Jack Bogle. There are great investing ideas all around you. You just have to open up your mind to them. And it's that whole notion that humans are so easy at recognizing ideas and trends, right? We, someone coined this phrase, natural language investing, right? Where you know what you want and being able to take that concept and put it to work. You know, that's what we, we obsess on here at Motif. Can I ask you a couple of questions, Karif? Uh, it's really interesting. One thing one is quite clear that she does is open up the whole of investment world to a larger number of people. Because of that, there are clearly risks. Now, this uh, we talked about this before about being in European, being from the UK, where we have a far stronger regulatory background. But you're opening people to risks start delving into the really really understand there is the question about the regulatory impact on your business as opposed to the professional uh, oriented business and the second question is what education comes with the that ability to change portfolios how are you going to help people actually learn how to do the job so so I'm just going to uh, I couldn't quite get the there's some interference here but the second question was uh, about education and how we deal with that and then the first question was around the regulation regulation so on the education front I'm, I'm glad you brought that up you know we, we've already licensed our content to teach uh, uh, newbie investors and even women and children how to invest right we've partnered with a company uh, and there's been a lot of research it's something I'm very passionate about uh, which is a, a traditional education models we have an investing crisis in the states uh, where people don't understand how much they need to save and even when they do they don't understand how their portfolios work 
And so a lot of them kind of give up and they kind of relinquish total control on that. So what we're doing on the educational front is, you know, it, it's amazing. We've, we've got these interesting motifs that even for, for, for young kids, you know, a, a woman called me up and said, Hardeep, she was the one who actually gave me the idea. Did you know I'm teaching my girls how to invest using your product? I've got teenage daughters. I said, no, I, uh, please tell me because I've got two young kids of my own. And she said, well, look, you have a, a motif called hot retail. And it's weighted, those, like, just like those sliders I showed you, by fashion accessory. So you've got jewelry, you've got athletic gear. So she says, what I do with my girls is we, we, we sit and we talk about the motif, and then we go visit Lululemon, we go visit Tiffany's, and we come back and we have a rich discussion on how we should customize mo our motif in preparation for this year's Christmas shopping. So think about what's happening there. That's a pretty sophisticated discussion. Uh, one of our customers is building a sports celebrity motif. He's got a young teenage boy who's into sports, so he's building a sports celebrity motif based on sports endorsements. So you can go long LeBron James and short Tiger, because Tiger's not been behaving himself, just using that motif. Now these are simple things, but they're real stocks, blue chip stocks, behind all of these scenarios. And, and there was a study that came out, I think it was a, a Wharton that put out a study, or it was, it was some, someone, basically traditional educational models of classroom training, getting people doesn't work. You need this kind of engagement, speaking a language that people understand, and use that as a pivot into explaining investing concepts. So we're, we're pretty excited, uh, and what you'll, you'll see us do more interesting stuff around education next year. Um, on the regulatory aspect, you know, we're, we are a member of FINRA. Uh, we are a broker-dealer. Um, there, there are a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of complexity around innovating. Um, you know, we are, we're also a social platform, um, so, so you know, a, a lot of, um, uh, there, there's a lot of challenge. There's only so much I can say publicly about regulatory issues, um, but, but, you know, I think it's been terrific to work with regulators, because everyone's actually, there's been a mindset change almost, that people want to work with innovators now. I mean, they're realizing there's a lot of work that needs to, to be done around innovation, and, and, and I think there's been a, a, a receptivity with regulators around doing that, uh, and, and we're, we're very grateful for that. Uh, and then specifically, I think you had a comment on margin and a whole set of different systems. Is that what did you mention? I couldn't quite hear. I'm sorry. What no, was your first specific question around regulatory? I, I think you answered a question quite beautifully. And okay. I just want to say to you also, I mean, normally we wouldn't really read the feedback on the show. I mean, we're literally having like audio feedback here. But the feedback we're getting is people are like utterly thankful for just knowing about this product. And uh, I mean, not nor you don't normally get that kind of response. Can you say something about how people are responding to this? I mean, this is like some proper innovation. Well, yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I never like bragging about our company, but no, we've uh, we've been overwhelmed with the amount of support. We've gotten a ton of press. Um, you know, no, no, no one's as uh, PR worthy as Howard, but uh, we've had a, a lot of very positive press. And and we've 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 heard, what's been remarkable is it's very hard to find an investing product, uh, and it's a tough marketing challenge to be honest, where you've got newbie investors who know very little saying this product is for me. I love it because it makes investing accessible, easy to understand. I'll buy one motif because I'm a health food nut and it's just my easy stepping stone into learning about investing. But then we also have these ultra sophisticated day traders that trade a motif 20 times a day, right? And they love some of the, we have some motifs that are really volatile uh, and they like that. And for us, they say two benefits. I can see a great idea and I don't have to do any homework. I can put my idea to work very quickly, but it also saves me a lot of fees. And I like the fact that we've made investing simple. So it's, it's very flattering to get feedback, but it's also the range of feedback from different customer segments. Uh, that's something we didn't expect to see. We do a lot of work on usability studies. We score very high with women, for example, which most investing products don't do, so we're pretty proud of that. Um, so we've been very um, very fortunate and, 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 and I'm very grateful for, for the support we've gotten so far. And I want to thank you so much, Hardeep, uh, for spending your birthday with us. <laughs> Thank you. Happy birthday. What are you, 25, 26? Yeah, I wish. No, I'm, I'm 41 today. No, seriously? Yeah, seriously. 
Wow. Well, I guess it's a good 41. I mean, uh, having raised over 50 million dollars introducing this awesome product and wowing everybody, it's got to be quite a good present. <laughs> well, thank you. No, those very kind words. Uh, I want to thank you and I want to thank Ed for sticking with us the entire broadcast. And uh, I mean, we've had some, I mean, this has been a day for tef technical difficulties. So we're upgrading all of our stuff, and it's going to be much better. Right now, we're just using Google Hangouts, and we have very little control. <laughs> and uh, just thanks to uh, um, uh, Hardeep, and thanks to Ed, and thanks to Howard for uh, he's halfway to San Diego by now. <laughs> I hope you have a good week. Thank weekend, you so much. Guys. Yeah, all the best. Wish you luck. Cheers. Thank you very much, Ed. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye.